Okay, so the bad news is I'm here again. The good news is 30 minutes only. What I want to do now is actually something completely different. Now, I don't mean that in the Monty Python sense, or do I? Um, remember, in, in my first talk, I was talking about these algebras that I, was, that I am particularly interested in, and David was also interested in them. But because I kept having to say there's nothing wrong with the quantum potential, and kept getting shouted down. Now I don't have to say that anymore, because it seems that a lot of people here are producing evidence which says, let's take it seriously and let's see how far we can get with it. So that's why I'm now doing something entirely different, which is what I wanted to do in the first place. And that is that underlying quantum mechanics is essentially a non-commutative geometry. And one of the things we've got to try and grapple with, I've got no solutions for you, I'm just trying to bring to your attention some ideas. We've got to grapple with what does it mean to have a non-commutative geometry. And I'm trying in this, without going into too much mathematical details, to get the spirit of the ideas across. And so we, I, I feel that quantum phenomena can be described using this non-commutative algebra. That's how they started. There was Heisenberg and Born and all those people in the early days. And then they gave up trying to understand what that geometry would mean. Oh, sorry, I've got a... Where's the... Where's, here it is. Okay. And then I want to show that in von Neumann's hands, this non-commutative geometry actually leads to the Moyal non-commutative geometry. And Moyal has a bad name, but I think an un, 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 unadvised bad name. And it seems that the Bohm model, and I'll show you this, the Bohm model actually is contained in the 1949 paper by Moyal. So it's coming out of a non-commutative structure. So could it be that these ideas are just a fragment on the top and there's some deeper structure which we should be probing? So I'm trying to get across. Um, and then I want to show the relation between con uh, configuration space because people always say to me, you can't do quantum mechanics in a phase space. That's not true. You can, provided it is non-commutative. You can't do it in a classical phase space. So what is the relation between the, the two? And then finally, to show how, my, almost my final slide, is to come back to David Bohm again and hope that I've convinced you that some of these ideas are responsible for Bohm's rather general ideas of the implicate order, shadow phase spaces, and so on. Okay? Okay. So how do we start? Well, I want to take up from the morning, this morning's talk, when I was talking about Clifford algebras, I was talking specifically about orthogonal Clifford algebras. That is, my algebra was going on, in the, my, my movements were going on in space-time. Uh, you just have simple uh, Lorentz transformations or you have just simple rotations. And sitting above there mathematically is a covering group, a double covering group. Okay. So then, what my dear friend Maurice de Gosson has taught me is that you can actually lift from the space-time into the covering group, and in the covering group, in the, in the case of the orthogonal group, you actually have not Schrodinger's equation or not any of those equations, you have a couple of non-commutative equations from which Schrodinger's equation emerges. They're more general than that. And therefore, and then when you look at the algebra of this a spinner space, you find you can put everything in the algebra. You've got a Clifford group, it's actually the spinner group. Now that all came out of Clifford's ideas of classical movements in space-time, 1878, before quantum mechanics was even thought of. Okay, so that takes care of the orthogonal, but you know, where's the Schrodinger's equation? Oh, sorry, and this is the, uh, what, what I'm, uh, a theoretician would do, would say, well, surely you're just talking about the fiber bundle picture. No, I'm talking about a Clifford bundle. And in a Clifford bundle, you have to be very careful how your operators work, whether they operate from the left or the right. Okay? All right, so then, and this is where Morris has been very good. He, he knows, if you want anything to know about symplectic geometry, get hold of his book. Or books. Okay, so I want to commission, you know, when I... Yeah. Okay, good. So, 
Now, what does this mean? Well, ray optics and Hamiltonian dynamics are all in this base space. The wave optics actually come out from the double cover. And for a long time, I didn't even realize there was a double cover called a metropathic group. And uh, what Schrodinger was doing was actually trying to combine these two without realizing what he was doing. But what you can do is you've got what uh, Morris and I, and I think it's mainly Morris, showed is that you can actually lift your, your flow patterns in classical space into flow patterns in this symplectic space, in, in the double cover, and you actually get Schrodinger's equation out in that double cover. So quantum mechanics seems to be living in these double covers, if I can use that kind of language. Okay, but I couldn't find a Clifford algebra anywhere for a long, long time. Now my pointer is working. Okay, but then came across this. I think this guy was a Belgian mathematician, Krummerol. I can't, I'm sorry I've forgotten his first name, but he actually published this book. Uh, and if, you, uh, if you're not a mathematician, I shouldn't open the uh, chapters of it, actually, because it's a bit thick, it's a bit heavy going. But the idea now is, the question is, how do I get the symplectic structure into the, Clifford, into the orthogonal Clifford algebra? And this is essentially what Penrose will be talking about, either tomorrow or Saturday, I don't know when he's coming on, with his palatial twister theory. So the aim is here not to embed algebras in space-time, but to actually abstract space-time properties from the algebraic nature. Okay, how'd you do that? I said this was something entirely different. You now have a look at a theorem of Gell-Mann and Neymark. Now, the traditional way we work is we take a manifold, we put a topology on it, we put a metric on it, and then we build up the field equations. But there is another way. That we, if, and this only works for a, com, a commutative algebra. Given a commutative algebra, you abstract out the topological and metro, metric properties from that algebra. And this is a fully-fledged mathematical theorem which says that if you've got that uh, commutative algebra, you can get all the properties of space and time out of it. For example, points actually come by the intersection of these functions, and that forms a maximal ideal rather than a left or right ideal that you have to put that I've been yatting on about. Okay, now, can you do the same for a non-commutative algebra? And this is where the work with Penrose earlier on, that, that he's influenced me on this, you essentially can. It's the light ray geometry, it's the twisters. And what you find there is that the classical world actually emerges from the quantum world, not the other way around. Okay, so how can I illustrate this? I've got a very simple model with just two generators and satisfying this non-commutation relation and where omega is just the nth root of unity. It so happens that when n is two, you've got a Clifford algebra, orthogonal Clifford algebra. When n goes to infinity, you've got a symplectic Clifford algebra. But it's discrete. And that means it's nice and easy to deal with, that even physicists can deal with it. Okay, remember this morning I talked about idempotence and you didn't know what the hell I was talking about? Well, this, the, the idempotents are actually the space, are they actually the points in this space you can construct them. The algebra has the points in them already. So you don't have to embed them in anything, they just are there, as it were, that you can make use of. And you also have a, uh, a, a translation, this is, this is essentially the, the role of the Clifford group, which takes you from one point to, so you can actually generate your space out of these operators T, which are in the algebra. So you've got automorphisms which generate the space. And you can actually label them, you can introduce an operator, and then you have your eigenvalue equation, and you label the points with one, two, three, four, five, and you have uh, the element of the ideal is just essentially a wave function. But it is in a discrete case. Okay, so the algebra itself contains the points. You don't have to embed it in anything. Right. Now, also in the algebra is you can find another set of idempotents, which are these idempotents. The other one had a zero there and a j there. This one has a j here and a zero there. And then you find that the generator is, which has the x element in here. If you're doing operators, that would be the position operator. And you can now generate another set of points called momentum space points. 
And once again, you can, you've got the eigenvalues. So you, this, is, this would be the P representation. And I'm very glad that you're doing that kind of thing because it's very important in this, this particular context I'm dealing with here. Sorry, that was Ephraim I'm pointing to, just in case. Okay, furthermore, there is a kind of finite Fourier transform between these two. And we learn here that it's not that the P points are hidden, they are not, they don't actually exist even in the algebra. So it's not a question of hidden variables, they just don't bloody exist. Okay, and so this is the idea that, uh, David's idea of explicate orders, you can either get out a, a shadow manifold in X space, or you can get out a shadow manifold in P space. So you've got this already, and this Pauli actually had PI and, and, and XI in his, one of the papers he had. Now, that was the discrete. Can you go to the continuum? Yes, if you go to the continuum, you find you get, just get the Heisenberg group. And this was done by Weil. I'm, I'm going through it very quickly because I don't think the details are essential here. Okay, now what was von Neumann's idea? Von, Neum von Neumann's idea was, can you take functions in your Hilbert space, the operators in Hilbert space, can you convert them into ordinary functions on the symplectic space? And the answer is yes, you can. And he shows that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between those two and your expectation values of your operators are this, and this just looks like a classical probability if you take alpha and beta as classical objects. Okay, now this is, this, this is just the Wigner function I'm talking about now, which gets a bad name because people say, is it a classical expectation value? If it is, you know the problem, the Wigner function has negative values. Probabilities cannot be negative. But if it's a non-commutative structure, you've got to start thinking again. Okay, and then if you, so where, where's the non-commutivity in this? The non-commutativity in this is that if you want to get the non-commutative product of the operators in the algebra itself, you've got to introduce a new operator, the a new product, the star product, and the star product is essentially a non-local product. Now, of course, most people say, well, why the hell do I want to do this? Because I'd rather have the, the simple pro uh, non-commutative products in the Hilbert space. But this is all in the algebra itself. So you can actually get these things out. And I say Moyal uh, actually reproduces all of von Neumann's work, but simply by writing alpha is equal to x and beta is equal to p. But it turns out that x and p are not the position of momentum of a particle. So what are they? Well, what you can do is you can take the density matrix and you can make a two-point density matrix. And then what you find is if you go to the coordinates, mean coordinates and difference, you can now write down your density matrix in terms of the mean coordinates and the difference. And so what you're really specifying here, this object here, it's actually a cell in phase space. And the X and P in the theory there are actually the mean values of this blob. You were worrying about the internal properties and there's a blob there and you know, what, 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 is, what, what is the rest of this structure? And I just raised, oh, there's a very interesting paper. You actually find that there, in classical physics, there is something like the uncertainty principle already there. And this is dear Morris's symplectic egg, which he's been sitting on for a long time and trying to hatch. Okay, so what do you do when you've got a, a non-commutative algebra? Well, Moyal has told us that you form sums and differences of the product. And these sums and differences are very interesting because when you go to the limit, there's h-bar in, I've never put h-bars in my formulae, unfortunately, but if you put them in, you find that if you go to the limit of order oh, uh, of h-bar squared, you actually get the Poisson bracket sack. And if you get the Baker bracket, which is not talked about much, but uh, it's something that, I, that people drew my attention to many years ago, and I thought that's very interesting, but what the hell does it mean? It simply means that you've got commutivity again. So you've got a non-commutative structure with classical physics underlying it. Okay. So now then, what about the dynamics? Well, then the dynamics is again non-commutative. So you must make sums and differences. And if you uh, 
subtract, you get the Moyle bracket giving you the time derivative of the density matrix, essentially. And that's just the classical Liouville equation. If you, if you do the Baker bracket, you get this funny looking, and this is a two-way derivative. I've got it down here. Look, it's the minus sign rather than the plus sign. And I didn't know what this equation was. In, in fact, then when I went to the limit, look what comes out. The classical hamilton jacobi theory is there. So that is the bone, a real part of the Schrodinger equation here already. OK, then it's quite clear that if Moyal has a, a classical phase or, or uses uh, a, um, symplectic space, then Bohm uses a symplectic space, so they must, be, they must be the same. And one day, sitting on a boring train from Gothenburg to Vexia, don't go by train. What you find is, I, I was able to sit down with no disturbances, and then I found yet another type of momentum, the Moyal momentum. And it turns out that it's the, I'm sorry, there's no bar on that red one there. It really should be a bar. The momentum is actually the conditional expectation value. If you treat this as a, a probability distribution, it's the conditional expectation value. So it's a, it's a kind of a mean value. And it's the bone momentum again. And this is all in, in his appendix. You then, he then discusses the transportation of that and finds it's the Schrodinger equation. And he's got the quantum potential there as well. And that's just 10 years before. No, not 10 years. No, I can't. I don't do, I'm no good at mathematics. Um, Three years, four years before. Three years, thank you. Okay. Right. So now, can you do this with the algebras? Yes, provided you remember you're taking... What you've got here, essentially, is you're trying to convert a two-sided ideal, two-sided mo um, module into a, a one-sided module. And because physicists don't know what that means, they don't realize there's some deeper structure underlying this. OK, so here, and here are the two equations which I put up, sneaked up in the earlier board. And when you write them out neatly, you'll see one seems to depend upon the uh, commutator, and that's just the conservation of probability. And one depends upon the anti-commutator, and that's just the conservation of energy. And then I thought, I thought I'd actually discovered a new equation. I went around kidding myself. I've got a new equation here. Nobody's seen it before. But no, the chemists have got it in a different form, and so I had to sort of... When I put this on the internet, I got immediately a, an email from um, I've got David Farley at Durham saying, no, no, mate, we've, we, 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 we've got it all ready. <laughs> so anyway, notice also that in these equations in the algebra, in the non-commutative algebra, no quantum potential is visible. And I should know, I should get you to note that these equations also work for the Pauli equation and the Dirac equation. So it works in the relativistic domain as well. OK, so how does the quantum potential arise then if it's not in that equation? It actually comes by projecting down into a representation. So if you project into the X representation, here you are, you get... I've taken a harmonic oscillator uh, uh, there deliberately because I've got, I'm now going to say, but there's more. You can actually choose a projection operator in the P space, and that will produce two equations uh, in uh, the momentum representation, so you get another um, quantum potential, only this time in P space. And this is what Ephraim was looking at in his experiments, which I'm very interested in, seeing what you get from that. In fact, I was so surprised that uh, I, I tried to remember, I've got Melvin is in the audience, I don't know whether he's still there or not, but he was in the audience earlier on. It's, it's hit really in, done in his thesis, where we actually worried about what this meant and how we could do it with P, uh, a, a potential not just X squared, which is, which is easy peasy, that's why I put it up there, but a more general P-dependent equation. <laughs> Okay, and for me, this means that Bohmian mechanics is but a fragment of a much deeper theory. That's the lesson I take away from this. Whether you should go through this way with the algebraic way or not, I don't know. But interesting to note, and I'll just about get this in, 
Dirac was there already in the 40s. And in fact, he was saying that uh, you have a series, provided these are all time ordered, he complains no one understands how to do non-commutative algebras. And then he says, but if you, if you preserve the time ordering, then you get something which looks like a trajectory and thus makes quantum mechanics more closely resemble classical mechanics. That's in his, in his paper, okay? And now, of course, if, you can, if, if what Morris did is correct, and you can actually lift from classical to quantum, there must be, um, we can lift onto the covering space. And in fact, you can very quickly go through using what we do with Feynman propagators, taking the S function as just the, the classical action. If you go to order epsilon, which is order delta T, what you find is that you get a momentum, and it's actually the bone momentum, which is made out of a backward derivative and a forward derivative. So that, what we mean by that, a backward derivative is a derivative coming to here, forward derivative is going from there to the future. Okay, so the derivatives are not continuous, and this is just Feynman's result in his paper. I was absolutely staggered to see that he actually wrote down the bone momentum in his paper, which defined, which was the starting point of Feynman integrals, path integrals. Okay. Now then, what about the weak values? Because that's what we've all been talking about here. And it turns out that if you uh, write this object down here, and then write, as always, whenever I'm doing anything with Bohm, I always put R equal to the IS in there to see what happens. And what you find is that you've got the Bohm momentum, and this is just now uh, Lev's and, and Aronoff's beautiful uh, uh, weak values. They just turn out to be there. But you've also got here the osmotic momentum. And this is what Bob was, uh, Rob was talking about earlier on. And then if, so you, if you put them together like a, a, a complex number, and once again, the chemists, I'm afraid, beat us. They had this Hirschfelter in, what is that, 1978. He had weak values in his, but he didn't call them that. He called them sub-observables because that was the language. And also I dug out a, 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 a letter I had from him which said, I'm sorry, because I, I was very interested in what he was doing then. And he said, I'm sorry, I can't go on any further with this because they've withdrawn my funding. So even the chemists had their funding withdrawn playing about with these ideas. And there's nothing Bohmian in this. This is just standard non-commutative quantum mechanics looking at it in a different way. Okay, and then my conjecture is that uh, what, what, what it's doing is that if you trap the particle in a given region, yeah, if you trap the particle in a given region, the momentum is spraying out. You, so that each one has a different momentum. So if you try and construct a path around there, you're going to get a Feynman zigzag. And then my conjecture is that the bow momentum is actually smoothing out the Feynman zigzags. Uh, well, also, sorry, uh, the, 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 there's also a point there. Where am I? Oh, God. Have I gone too far? Much too far. Yeah, I'm not going miles back. Sorry about this. Yeah, I also wanted... No, I'm still going for it. I wanted to point out a very nice paper which I've just picked up again. And I can tell you I had it a long time ago because it was yellow. It was the oldest Xerox yellow ones where Aronoff and Vardy actually discuss this problem. They do it in a different way, but it's a very interesting take on exactly the same idea. Okay, so now I want to just finish off to see how this is related to David Bohm's philosophical outlook. That the deeper structure gives rise to a non-commutative phase space, and this, uh, in the context of non-commutativity, not all the orders can be a manifest at the same time. So you can either talk about the X representation or the P representation, you can't put them into the same picture. Okay, now the idea then was that the P space is actually a hologram because I think David used the idea that this point would be exploded under that similarity transformation into all the points of P space. This is really non-locality in, <laughs> in a very uh, intense way. And furthermore, 
that quantum processes, and I'm, I'm going to get caned for this, is not going, down, going on in space-time, but space-time is being abstracted as an approximation from what is actually going on. Okay, now what we mean by the implicate, or I always put this up just for a last slide, the gestalt. Is it a, a young lady or is it an old lady? Unfortunately, I always see the old lady. I must draw. <laughs> e even, <laughs> even now, normally it's 50-50. But this is the idea of the expert order. You can't take your structure out and have one explicate picture of it. Okay? Okay, let her go away. And so what the idea there is that the algebra is the implicate order you project out explicate orders, and it's only in the classical world that you put them together again into one order. So in this sense, the classical world is emerging from this deeper implicate order, which is the non-commutative geometry. Thank you. <laughs>